Uh, so welcome to our panel discussion for the exhibition Engage, uh, Artists in Visual Dialogue. Uh, this is an inclusive exhibition of 22 modern and contemporary artists curated by Stephen J. Tyson, and it responds to the present moment, celebrates diverse heritages, and envisions new futures. Spanning 91 years, this multifaceted show invites the viewer to see our world through many media and perspectives, as each artist shares a unique and compelling story of the human experience. Uh, so let me introduce Stephen J. Tyson. Stephen J. Tyson was born and raised in New York City. He graduated from high, the High School of Music and Art, attended the Art Student League, Students League of New York, uh, the Rhode Island School of Design, and earned his BFA from Manhattanville College and his MFA from City College of New York. He was tenured as an art teacher with the New York City Board of Education and as an associate professor of studio art and art history at the University of Pittsburgh in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. He has been a fine arts faculty member at Siena College, SUNY Albany, uh, Union College, and is currently an instructor of fine arts at SUNY Schenectady and SUNY Adirondack. In 1988 and 1995, he was awarded Fulbright Hayes Fellowships to study in Nigeria and in Namibia and Botswana, respectively. Those experiences further inspired his interest in pattern design, evident in a series of paintings and drawings he has continued to produce since 1994. He has also drawn inspiration from the field of cellular biology, astronomy, illuminated manuscripts, Australian Aboriginal art, the mural designs of Kasena in West Africa, digital photography, and music. His work has been featured at venues such as the New York State Museum, the Schenectady Museum, now my side, and the Black, National Black Fine Art Show in New York City. And it's included in collections of the New York Public Library's Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture, the Schenectady Museum, Hudson Valley Community College, Siena College, as well as in numerous private collections. Mr. Tyson has also served as a curator, lecturer, arts consultant, and panelist, including on NISCA's Special Arts Services, moderator and gallery assistant. And we welcome you, Stephen J. Tyson. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. This is one of um, Stephen's works. Um, it's uh, not in the exhibition, but I asked him to share one so that we could see what um, his work looks like. Um, uh, next, let me introduce Marcus K. Anderson. Um, this is his work uh, that's in the exhibition uh, on the screen right now. Uh, Marcus K. Anderson was born in Kingston, Jamaica and moved to upstate New York at an early age. He's an illustrator and fine artist who's been creating art since he was able to lift a crayon. Uh, much of his work is a representation of the beauty and diversity of the African diaspora. He believes that the arts can be a powerful vehicle for change and often incorporates social commentary into his work. Anderson graduated from SUNY College at Fredonia with a degree in illustration. He is the co-creator of an ongoing book series, Snow Days, and has illustrated stories in action, uh, I'm sorry, stories in Action Lab's all ages detective series, Cash and Carry. He has also done some illustration work for the Action Lab series, Force. And in January, uh, the Black Panther Party a graphic novel history will be released by Penguin and Random House. Anderson illustrated uh, this text that was written by David F. Walker. And thank you so much for joining us tonight, Marcus. Thanks for having me. Uh, Daisha Devon Harris, whose work you, uh, it, you, which you see on the screen, and this is the work in the exhibition. Um, she is a Saratoga Springs, New York artist and photographer who has spent time in Buffalo, New York and San Francisco. Both her multicultural family and the unexpected death of her young father have greatly shaped her life. She holds a BFA in studio art uh, from right here at the College of St. Rose and an MFA in visual art from the University at Buffalo. She's a member of various organizations and plays an active role in her community as a youth mentor, social activist, and cultural history preservationist. The gentrification of her hometown and its effect on the local black community has played a major role in both her advocacy and artwork. Most recently, she has been an NFOCO fellowship winner. Uh, she's also um, uh, been an M MDOC Storytellers Institute fellow and artist in residence at the Center for Photography at Woodstock, the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology, uh, the studios of Key West and the Yaddo Artist Colony, uh, an Aaron Siskin Foundation Individual Photographers Fellowship awardee and a Niska NIFA 
uh, artist fellow in photography, and she was named one of the Royal Photographic Society's 100 heroines. She's an avid fisherwoman and a hobbyist gardener. And thank you, Daisha Devon Harris, for joining us tonight. And finally, I'd like to introduce Fern Logan. Uh, she utilizes the photographic image as an art form. She reveals her photo art through portraiture and landscape. Uh, this is her piece in the exhibition. Her work as a photographer creating art for the United States, the Caribbean, uh, India, Central and South America reinforced this emphasis. In the past, uh, like the early work you see her, her subject was primarily restricted to landscape scenes. Eventually she resolved to put the human figure into her repertoire and began work on a photo documentary book entitled The Artist Portrait Series, uh, in which she photographed prominent black artists such as Elizabeth Catlett, uh, Jacob Lawrence and Romare Bearden. Um, uh, on the screen, uh, you see Corrine Simpson. Uh, we have one of Corrine Simpson's prints in the exhibition and, and she's also one of the artists uh, that Fern Logan photographed. Um, Fern Logan began the series believing philosophically that art is an educational tool. It was the actualization of this desire to document the careers of highly accomplished black visual artists that led to this work being awarded a grant from the New York State Council on the Arts. The series was eventually published by Southern Illinois University Press. Always present in Logan's photographs is an aesthetic of beauty, drama, and mood. She states that capturing these elements in her work is a special challenge. She views photography as a spiritual experience. Her favorite statement is, I don't take photographs, they are given to me. Logan, who is Professor Emerita of Cinema and Photography at Southern Illinois University, completed her MFA at the School of the Art Institute at Chicago. She has taught photography and graphic design at Elmhurst College, Illinois, and Michigan T Technological University. Uh, and she's been exhibiting since the early 1970s when she emerged as a promising photographer from Paul, Paul Caponegro's Aperon Workshop in Millerton, New York. She's shown at the Smithsonian Institution, the Studio Museum in Harlem, uh, Kenna Kavlik Gallery, among others. The Harlem State Office Building, the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture, and the Bellevue Hospital Center in New York City have Logan's work in their permanent collections, as does Michigan Technological University. Logan has shown in numerous state museums and galleries. Her work with digitally manipulated imagery was honored with two Illinois Arts Council fellowships in 1998 and 2001. Ms. Logan was included in the 2001 exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum, Reflections in Black, Contemporary Af American, African American Photographers. And thank you so much, uh, Fern Logan, Marcus K. Anderson, Daisha Devon Harris, and Stephen J. Tyson for joining us tonight. Um, so, uh, Stephen, I thought we could open up by uh, talking a bit about the, the uh, process for this exhibition. The, the show builds on um, the New York State's Harlem Art Collection um, and the University Art Museum's collection on the one hand, and then the work of contemporary regional artists uh, on the other. Uh, what themes began to emerge as you were looking at these collections, as you were looking at the regional artists, and ultimately what story uh, did you want the exhibition to tell? Well, thank you, Robert. And um, I'm just delighted to be here with all of these incredible artists. That's one of the things that I recognize right away. Uh, the mastery of these artists in the Harlem Art Collection at the University of Albany. Uh, I was struck by the fact that this was history, that this were, these were masters of art. Uh, and I wanted to bring attention to these particular individuals. They helped through their sacrifices to pave the way for many of us and future generations. And I was felt that it was important to not only recognize the incredible talent that existed in the past and those artists who were still producing from that collection, but also that we have people in our community who are also very talented and of the highest caliber. And uh, a couple of those people, certainly uh, uh, the local artists, uh, Daisha and Marcus among them, are, are just a handful of the artists that are in this show. And I wanted to make sure that people recognize that you don't have to necessarily go to these um, you know, established museums and so forth, that we have important artists right here in our community that we also need to support and recognize, and that they are all part of one, that the history continues and it moves forward and progresses. And I wanted that to be clear and make that accessible to many generations, to the young, up to the old.
Thank you, Stephen. And I, I think one of the major themes that emerges in the exhibition is um, uh, spirituality. Uh, we see it uh, connecting a number of the pieces from uh, from past and, and present. Uh, Daisha and Fern, if, if you could talk maybe about the role of uh, spirituality in your work, perhaps it, how it connects to, uh, to, to nature. Well, I'll be happy sure. to start. Um, for me, um, it's a very personal thing, uh, especially, well, I shouldn't say especially, but with landscape, with a name like Fern, you're kind of rooted <laughs> in the <laughs> landscape. <laughs> And um, I approach uh, any art making uh, uh, with the concept that I'm a vessel and the, the uh, energy and the spirit that informs my work, I don't control it. It's something that comes through me. So that's why I say I am given images. I don't take them you take them, you're claiming them, you, you're, you know, it's something you did, you're taking all the credit for it. And I just don't get my best images when I approach the work that way. Mm -hmm. I tend to mess things up. I trip over the tripod, I knock the camera over, you know, something like that happens. But when I open myself up, it also, it calms you, it puts you in the moment, you're centered, and you allow the image to come through. And I get my best work that way. For uh, Daisha, what's been your experience uh, with the, the spiritual in art? Well, I think that um, I find it in many places um, and that it means different things at different times. Um, right now, I've been thinking about um, surviving white supremacy and resisting and fighting against white supremacy as an act of spirituality. And um, in comparison to that, I feel that there is an absence of the spirit or soul when people engage in oppression and violence towards other people. Um, and that's the way I've been thinking about it lately, especially over the past uh, six months when we just see so much anti-Black violence. And I especially need to look towards um, my family and my faith for um, strength and support to, to continue and to um, just continue fighting. And um, you're really a source of strength for uh, others too. You're very involved um, in the um, in, in your community, right? Um, with um, uh, activist work and, and helping the youth. I think yeah. that that's a um, uh, a really good connection with a lot of the artists um, in the uh, in the exhibition. Um, so um, uh, Roger Caban, for instance, a part of Infoco. Uh, was also a um, social worker and uh, Royal G. Brown, uh, one of the artists in the exhibition, let me pull up um, his work, uh, is also a licensed clinical uh, social worker. Uh, these um, uh, Afrofuturist designs of um, uh, uh, spaceships in a kind of dragon form made from, uh, made from found objects. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this connection and any of you can answer this uh, between your art making practices uh, in the way in which you engage and, and reach out to uh, your audiences, your your communities. I mean, I'll, I'll go. Uh, I, I have always found uh, art, for me personally, um, is something to be experienced um, almost as a community effort. You know, you know what I mean? Like, um, and actually, I really relate to what what Fern had said about the art coming through through us. Mm -hmm. And um, in that sense it kind of, uh, it, it, it allows you to really commune with others, both um, ancestors, which is definitely something I deal with in my work, but also even acting as a bridge, you know, from the past to the present and future. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just, I feel like I might've gotten away from the original question, but, um, you know, I mean, for me that our work is definitely something that, uh, is to be shared and it's not so much about the artist or 
the artist uh, ego, but it's a it's a larger effort. Yeah, and that sense of history, I think, really comes through the entire exhibition, Stephen, these connections that we draw between um, the, the, the present moment and the, the contemporary artists, some of the more historical uh, works. Um, there's a kind of lineage, uh, the Enfoco example with uh, Daisha Devon Harris, um, uh, for instance. Yeah. Um, and even um, uh, one of the pieces in the exhibition is um, your uncle's uh, work. Um, maybe, maybe we could talk about um, him and the uh, impact that he had on you. My uncle, uh, David Lloyd Tyson, uh, he was an individual that was uh, born to uh, parents who came from the Caribbean islands, from the uh, Gingerland section of Nevis. And uh, they arrived here as many in the early 1920s. And he was born in the section that is now, uh, it was called Sugar Hill. I'm not sorry, Sugar Hill. It was called um, um, San Juan Hill. And San Juan Hill was a section pretty much in the area of where Lincoln Center is now. And it was a community of uh, West Indian uh, immigrants and um, Black folk from the South. And uh, he uh, grew up and was interested in photography from a very early age. And as the years went on, well, I should really back up a minute and explain that um, uh, he was not only interested in photography, but he was also interested in the sciences. Uh, and he was among the first uh, uh, Black graduates of the High School of Science, the Bronx High School of Science in New York City. Uh, this was in 1941. And uh, then he went uh, into the uh, army. He became a second lieutenant, uh, fought in the Philippines and was stationed in Japan. But prior to that, he had also, um, you know, was very curious. He loved music. He loved a variety. He was very eclectic in terms of his interests, but he also had a very keen social consciousness. And this was in part due to my grandmother, his mother, uh, who was involved in community, was a, in a sense laid the groundwork for community organizing in the head of her, um, uh, the school uh, committees uh, in the Bronx, wherever her children were, she made sure that she was, uh, you know, the head of the teachers associations and so forth. So um, this kind of activism and involvement, I think, sowed the seeds so that when he eventually, he, um, left the army and he was studying at the City College of New York, studying engineering, that he participated in 1948 in a demonstration. Uh, it was really a demonstration of protest against anti-Semitism uh, and racial discrimination at City College. And so there was a strike and that went on for, for over a year at City College. And so these were the seeds that eventually led to his uh, photographing and documenting uh, various types of demonstrations in different parts of, um, of the country. This particular uh, photograph called Rising Together was part of the spring mobilization uh, to end the war in Vietnam, which took place in California and New York City uh, at Dag Hammarskjöld uh, Plaza. Uh, that's near the UN. And uh, so he was there. Martin Luther King also spoke at this event, uh, uh, indigenous speakers as well, uh, leaders of the indigenous community. Uh, Stokely Carmichael, among others. And so you see in this photograph, uh, young people, high school, college, um, many like the students at the College of St. Rose and other places uh, that are locked arm in arm uh, together, rising together, exercising their First Amendment right, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, appeal to the, to the government, to protest, to demand change. Uh, against the abuses of war and violence uh, that was taking place uh, in their name uh, overseas. And so he became a, a very keen documentarian on this kind of uh, 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 situation. And I think that um, activism on campus is um, uh, particularly meaningful um, to us now as, as students come to the gallery and, and see this work. Um, to see that um, people have come before them and have protested for the, uh, the right to uh, be treated with uh, dignity and to be heard on their, on their campuses. That's right. Yeah. 
and um, uh, to to be heard. I, I just want to pick up on what you said. Mm -hmm. To be heard, the part of the uh, important thing about this show is for people to slow down, to take time, and to engage in a dialogue and communicate, to listen to each other. You know, listen to the stories. Each of us have stories, but sometimes we're so busy on the hamster wheel, we don't we don't have time to really step back and listen to ourselves, you know, acknowledge our own existence, you know, that we are not just some cog, but that, so I wanted to create a forum where there was a diversity of different types of art. When people think about black people or black art or whatever, you know, category you want to put it in, I wanted there to be a variety so that you can't put it in a box. I wanted people to think beyond category, as Duke Ellington would say, to get outside the box that we create for ourselves or that people create for us. And so that was the other purpose of this show. And this is that kind of statement, you know, coming together beyond the differences, looking at the differences, accepting the differences and moving forward together. Yeah, and that comes through beautifully uh, in the show. Um, I hope everyone in the audience will get a chance to see it. Um, you know, too often um, as art historians and curators, uh, we, um, sort of box black art into particular categories. It, um, we're only interested in it when it deals with social issues. Um, and uh, here we see a whole range of um, uh, black beauty, black joy, protests. Um, it, it, it's a really um, comprehensive um, exhibition uh, in terms of those experiences uh, that again, I hope um, uh, a lot of audience members will see themselves uh, uh, reflected and the um, rainbow. Think, yes. Yeah. Uh, thinking about this kind of um, activism, uh, I thought, Marcus, maybe we could turn to your work on the uh, Black Panther um, uh, project. Um, so um, for, for many of the, um, uh, for much of your, your work here, you're, you're working from source material, uh, such as the, the famous photograph of Huey Newton, uh, we have uh, Fred Hampton speaking. Fred Hampton was one of the um, Black Panther leaders. Um, uh, he was killed uh, in a uh, police raid. Uh, and uh, Angela Davis um, as, as well. Um, could you tell us a bit about your um, uh, process as you're, you're working with this source material, you're translating into the graphic novel? Uh, what is it you're hoping the audience will kind of see through the image that you create that we wouldn't get um, get originally. And, and we do have a lot of um, uh, artists and graphic designers uh, in the audience too, a lot of a lot of students who I'm sure will be interested in the process. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I was, uh, you know, fortunate uh, to be brought onto this project with, uh, with David uh, F. Walker, who is really like, you know, one of the most uh, brilliant writers in um, comics right now, period, uh, but definitely um, also known for, you know, just being a, a Black writer who is really um, telling, you know, complicated uh, uh, stories that really challenge, uh, you know, readers and society. Um, and, uh, you know, the Black Panther Party, to me, like, has always been important um, in a lot of ways, you know, even though they were before my time, uh, Actually, the party was born uh, on my birthday exactly 10 years before I was born. Um, so I was born in 1976, October 15th, and uh, the party was founded in uh, 1966, um, October 15th. But anyway, uh, what I was hoping to translate uh, and what we as a team were working to translate is the just the, 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 the complicated history of the party. Um, it's an often um, incomplete history. Um, a lot of people don't know, for instance, that uh, the gun control in America wasn't really a thing until um, the Black Panther Party decided to, um, you know, carry arms, to open carry, as, as many, uh, you know, non-Black people do uh, currently in the United States, um, with the express um, purpose of self-defense and, um, you know, protecting themselves and community from over policing and from po police brutality. Um, but, you know, magically, you know, gun control was was a thing and it was legislated by um, Ronald Reagan, no, 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 none other than Ronald Reagan, 
you know, so long story short, like the, the Black Panther Party, um, you know, they provided, uh, you know, food services and uh, free breakfast for, for children. Um, you know, so many of the programs that are, are still operating today, you know, they, they paved the way um, medical services for, um, for people in the community. Um, and they're oftentimes painted with a broad brush, you know, as, um, you know, just being, being negative or violent. And it's a much more complete story. And with this book, what we sought to do was to um, give context to the party. I would say context um, to answer your question about like what I was trying to do. Like, I would say giving context is number one. Um, and that happens visually uh, through some of these images that you see here, like the image of Fred Hampton and Angela Davis are from some of the more biographical pages, but the book itself, um, it kind of bounces back and forth between a comic book narrative. So we are telling a story, it's a true story, but we also didn't want it to be static and you know, just a bunch of biographical pictures. So um, what, what ends up happening is, yes, like so for some of these images like of Fred Hampton, uh, I began, you know, obviously I did a lot of research, um, you know, visual and otherwise. And, uh, you know, I would, I would create line drawings uh, based on the image. And um, obviously I got creative with the color in places. Um, orange and blue are kind of my favorite uh, complementary color pattern, you know. So a lot of the book's color theme does lean towards orange and blue. Um, and so I just really tried to, uh, you know, as I was speaking before about are speaking through us and ancestors and those who came before us and inspired us, you know, speaking through, that's what happened here. Um, so, you know, and uh, one of the challenges with the book is that I had to, to simultaneously tell history, you know, and be truthful and honest with that history, but also let it be like a narrative that flows, like, you know, in the comic book medium. So um, it was a it was a real interesting balancing act and a challenge, but um, you know I think we I think we accomplished it. That's forthcoming in January, uh, published by Random Penguin uh, Random House. Uh, Fern Marcus was just talking about um, uh, kind of uh, history and ancestry. I, I was hoping maybe we could talk about um, your work on uh, the African diaspora series. Uh, which kind of connects um, past with uh, with the present, specifically um, uh, uh, Katrina. Yes, um, this is a true story. Uh, of course, uh, I have taken liberties with it because uh, the participants lived several centuries ago. But the woman in this story represents uh, an African woman whose name was Marie, Marie, Marie Therese, Therese Quinquin, which looks like coin coin, but in French it's Quinquin. And uh, she came over and actually became the slave of a Frenchman. And unfortunately, you know, he's the one most people remember. I can't remember his name. I think that's very significant. But um, she had uh, uh, 12 or 13, maybe more, I don't remember exactly, 16 children with him. And those are the descendants of the Creoles of today. So I wanted to tell Marie Therese's story. And um, I started this series with uh, my model. Um, we started, we made it seem like she was in Africa. This, this uh, location in Louisiana is Cane River and it's very primal um, in that it, it hasn't uh, been um, spoiled with uh, gentrification or it, it's very original to the, the landscape especially. So uh, there's still a lot of uh, several, there's several uh, plantations still um, there that are maintained. And um, the image on your uh, right 
was taken, well, all of the images were taken about uh, less than a year after Hurricane Katrina, but there was still a lot of damage, uh, especially in New Orleans. So we went from Cane River, which is on the left, um, and Marie always carried, well, in my story, she carried this burden on her head, which represents the burden that all African-American women well, maybe I shouldn't say all, but many African women, African American women carry to this day. And maybe it's the burden of racism or the burden of class or, you know, gender, all of those, the, the baggage that we carry, uh, that's her carrying it wherever she goes. And as the African, when she's represented as the African, she's represented without, um, uh, she's bare-breasted as they were in Africa. And then when she came here and was enslaved, her breasts are covered. And um, so there, it's quite a, a significant series. There are a lot of images in it. Um, and it, it, I try to, uh, cross generations with the story and represent our history, our ancestors, you know, and um, I was quite pleased with the result. I think it, uh, it has a lot of meaning to me and especially the parts, I mean, in New Orleans, it was just heartbreaking to see the devastation still almost a year later. These were done in May of, uh, 2006 and Katrina was in August of 2005 and still there was so much devastation. Yeah, so it included the landscape and the figure which um, I enjoyed combining the two. And my model was an artist as well so she was very engaged in the story as as I was. Yeah, one of the things I find really compelling about this work and um, Daisha's work in, in general is the way both of you weave together history and, and nature. Uh, you were photographing these in rivers and in um, ponds, right? Could you describe your process a bit and then maybe tell us what this um, connection is for you between nature and, and history? Yeah. Um... So um, when I began this series, it was in the spring or summer of 2012, um, following the murder of Trayvon Martin. And um, I was thinking about, um, you know, how many unnamed uh, ancestors there, there are um, and, and I just, when that happened and there was no, um, you know, accountability or justice for his life being taken, I just, I just felt, um, right then that it was going to be, um, it was just going to open a can of worms and onslaught, um, and which, which obviously it has. And so, um, at that point, I was feeling um, obviously pretty depressed as many people were and I didn't feel like photographing um, living people at that point. Um, and so I turned to a collection of unidentified um, portraits that I have, mostly um, Victorian era, early 1900s photographs of um, African-American individuals. And I'd always wanted to do something with this collection of photos. I, I wasn't sure what, um, but just, um, you know, the fact that they had been lost or separated from their families, the people who love them made me want to get them out and, you know, um, have people see them again. And so, um, I photographed the first image in the series at Lake Lonely in Saratoga, 
which is a place that my family has been going to for generations. Um, we, we go there just to sit on the riverbank and, and talk, mostly fishing was involved. Um, but the water, the water is a place that um, my family has just inherently been drawn to for, for generations. Um, and um, from there, I started thinking about um, the, the waterways that lead north you know, when you think about um, moving towards freedom, um, escaping from slavery, you think about the North Star. And north of me in um, just past Lake Placid, about two hours north, is the resting place of John Brown. And I believe nine other um, freedom fighters who were with him at um, the raid of Harper's Ferry. And that's a place that I go to. Uh, that's actually a place that I visited after Michael Brown was murdered. And um, so, you know, the, the journey there becomes like sort of a, a grieving slash healing um, tradition, I guess you would say. And so, so I decided to photograph my way um, through the waters from my hometown to up to um, the area where John Brown is laid to rest. And those are the, the rivers and the waterways where I photograph each of, each of these people actually in the water. Yeah, because you, you work with, you transfer these appropriate photographs onto transparencies that you then float in the water, right? And, and re-photograph them that way. Um, yeah, um, speaking of home and uh, the, the area around you, you've done a lot to um, document life in um, uh, Saratoga, right? Um, uh, with the work that you see here. And I, and I see a, a real strong resonance between this and what a lot of the um, photographers in the exhibition were doing, such as the, um, the group, the Camoingue workshop, um, uh, a collective of black photographers in Harlem who wanted to create images to counter the negative images of Black people in the press. Um, and so they show you know, vibrant scenes of, of Harlem life uh, or the Infoco group, uh, likewise, uh, not seeing um, Puerto Rican um, uh, identity represented um, uh, in the media, in the art world. Uh, and so they had that first Dos Mundos um, uh, exhibition uh, 50, 50 years ago. Uh, what, what what do you want your um, viewers to know about um, your hometown, Saratoga, as they're looking at your at your work? Yeah, so growing up in Saratoga, um, the Black community has um, has uh, disappeared to half, not disappeared, been run out to half. Um, it as a, to half the number it was when I was born. And right now we're less than 2% of, of the entire population. And so um, it was always important to me to um, research, to learn about, to talk about, and to um, shine a light on the history that is like barely visible, if even at all acknowledged in Saratoga. And uh, most importantly, to celebrate the people who are still here living and thriving. And, and in that way, um, you'll see the, the photograph to the right. Um, the production of the, of the photographs is really important to me too. I like, I didn't think about it this way until the other day as like, as an act of community care, but but to me, the people who I'm photographing, I love, and and I'm do I'm doing it because I want to honor them and and for people to see them and acknowledge them, and especially for the youth. Um, I've been a mentor to um, young people for like the past 20, 25 years. It was always important for me to photograph them and spend time with them because. Uh, their experiences in school and just, you know, around town were 
not positive for the most part. And I wanted them to feel, you know, important and loved because they are. And, and hopefully I would help them, um, you know, foster better, um, what's the word? Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's a simple word, not character. Self-esteem. Self -esteem. Yeah. yeah. My brain is mushy these past six months. Please excuse me. <laughs> but yeah, it was a way for me to, um, you know, just try and encourage and help them gain self-esteem through, you know, adolescence, which is the most pivotal time in a person's life. And um, yeah, I, and, and so that's what, basically when I photograph people, um, I like to involve as many people as possible. So it's also like a community effort. Um, and to me, the process is the best part. Um, and, you know, the, the final product is, is the end point, but it's really the, the making of it and the relationship that we have and the experience that we have making that making the image that is, is most valuable to me. Yeah, I think that really shows in the work. You can see your connection to these people and the, the viewer feels it too. Um, uh, there's a comfort um, between uh, the, well, now the viewer and the, and the subjects of the photograph, but between you and, you and them, um, the, just the, the depth of feel, the, uh, the way you've used it to get our, our focus um, on, the, on the people. And they're just beautiful, affirming images. And you can tell they're, not taken with a an outsider's view or a anthropological or colonizing kind of gaze. Um, uh, yeah, there's a real um, warmth and apt affirmation um, in the in the work. Um, and speaking of the people who are uh, still in Saratoga, there's uh, your great uncle Joseph Daniels, right? Who uh, was uh, one of your inspirations um, as an artist. Uh, he's still. Uh, making work, and he has been part of Black Dimensions in art, I think, right? Um, mm -hmm. That a number of our artists um, here are, are part of. Actually, I think, uh, Daisha Marcus, Stephen, are you all part of Black Dimensions? Yes. Yep, yep, so, uh, yeah. yes. yep. um, <laughs> that's, so they're in um, uh, the capital region since 1975 or so, 75. Stephen? Uh, tell yes. us a little bit. Yep, yes. um, promoting um, the uh, art of the African diaspora, uh, made up here and offering educational programs for youth, uh, workshops, classes. That, that's correct. And, and, yep. and just to take a moment, Black Dimensions in Art grew out of the Black Arts Movement, the 1960s that, that we were referring to a little bit earlier. Uh, people like Mars Hill, Catherine Revis, Margaret Cunningham, uh, Linda Jackson Chalmers, Mickey Kahn, uh, the, the list goes on, James Cunningham. These are individuals that, that paved the way and that provided opportunities in this capital region where there were really no opportunities at all. And their mission continues to this day, along with the Hamilton Hill Arts Center. You know, so big shout out to, to the hard work and the good work that they're all doing. For a moment ago, Daisha was talking about um, art as a way to help uh, build the self-esteem self of her subjects, a way to um, uh, for her to grieve. Um, and I was hoping we could talk about your work in the um, uh, exhibition. Um, you, um, uh, in your statement uh, for this piece, uh, you, you indicate that it, you, you had made it during a very difficult um, time in your life. Um, at the end of your statement, you said, this piece is an, is an example of what, uh, this piece is an example of what can happen in life when we take one step at a time. Uh, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on that, taking one step at a time. Is, was art sort of a way of, of um, healing uh, uh, for you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes, it was a very unstable time um, for me. And uh, the way the image happened, it was, again, a very spiritual moment. Um, I was taking a picture of the, the marsh and the reflection in the water and the camera was on a tripod and the, the dog walked in front of the camera and I just instinctively or whatever you want to call it, took just made an exposure. 
And then afterwards, I saw the relationship of the images and thought of it as a, a moment in time, which was also a transitional moment in time. And as, as my life was in transition, um, and the dog is in motion. So the, the moment starts with motion and you always, even today, you know, in this moment of time, we feel like things are not moving, <laughs> we're stuck, it's stagnant. But in the end, it, every step you take makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And as Daisha was saying, you know, it just, it, it's historical, but things keep moving and and water, you know, is just so, mm. so spiritual, so deep within us. And it is, it is a, an element of motion. So this, this piece always just resonated with me. Um, and I think when I was talking to, you, I mentioned that the, the concept of, um, images be being placed in sequence like this uh, was actually inspired by Dwayne Michaels, mm -hmm. who was um, an artist that I've always enjoyed this. Yes, you have an example of one of his pieces. Um, uh, he, he was a very, um, very much an inspiration for me as far as, you know, format for, for image making. Um, and we had also talked, I don't know if I'm going off subject, but we talked a little bit about the process of image making and how, you know, it all started with black and white. Yes, imagery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was kind of lamenting the fact that back when I started photography, it was all about the dark room and, you know, Ansel Adams and the multiple tones you can achieve and how you have to slave over the negative to get the shadows and the highlights. And now you just use a slider on the computer, <laughs> you know, so things do change. You keep taking one step at a time and um, things are going to change. I don't think you can stop change. It may not always be the change you want to see, but, you know, Martin Luther King, I re recently became aware of a, a, a statement he made that I hadn't heard before. And he said that the universe leans in the direction of justice. Mm -hmm. I may be paraphrasing a little, but it, it was a very poignant statement for me. And it gave me a lot of hope. And another quote that I'd like to give, uh, about this image of transition and spirituality. It's from um, Walt Whitman, who was someone very much connected to nature. He said, I witness and I wait. So that's a little bit about transition too. And by the way, um, oh, I, I always confuse Saratoga with Saratoga Springs. So. <laughs> the Yaddo studio. Well, Daisha, you were at Yaddo too, so you probably recognize the studio. This I do. Uh, immediately. I, I, I mean, it, that's like the most beautiful place there. And so I was immediately so excited and struck when I saw that image of yours. Yeah. 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 That was a magical piece because I, when I was there in residence, I struggled for most of my residency were trying to use the four by five camera and uh, developing those negatives. And I just couldn't get an image that I liked. And finally I just said, I'm gonna use my, my Hasselblad. <laughs> and this is what I ended up with. Said, well, that was worth, it. <laughs> again, it's that one step at a time, you know? And once you surrender, you're surprised at what you can, what you're given. Mm. Yeah. Thinking about these trajectories, um, you know, moving from uh, 
past and to present, um, maybe we could turn to one of Marcus's pieces before we go to the Q and A uh, and talk a bit about the the future and kind of visionary futures this piece. I love sci-fi. I love Afrofuturism, and uh, um, but yeah, I think so. As we're sort of envisioning futures, um, Marcus, could you tell us a bit about um, this work? This is a recurring character. Um, I think you've printed her on. Um, T-shirts. You've done other illustrations. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. This character um, was, you know, basically came to me uh, when I was uh, sketching. I think initially, probably like five years ago. Um, and yeah, Afrofuturism is um, is huge to me. Um, you know, just uh, to anyone who's not familiar, um, you know, it just kind of deals with um, the concept of being able to envision ourselves, you know, as black people in, in the future in speculative fiction, science fiction, um, you know, much like that's a uh, shout out to, to Royal, um, you know, like his spaceships are um, like, you know, a perfect example of that, um, of taking, taking found objects and, you know, creating something futuristic. Um, so one of the things I love about Afrofuturism is I think a lot of Black people, you know, grow up enjoying um, science fiction, consuming it, or comics, or all types of different media. But you know, for a long time, we didn't necessarily see ourselves. And um, you know, there's been you know a lot of brilliant creators. Um, I have to give a shout out also to um, uh, Lovecraft Country is on HBO. It just uh, finished the first season, just finished last night, and um, it 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 was brilliant um and it's a series that you know deals with historical fiction but also uh afrofuturism at the same time and really spans genres and i mean i think it's the perfect example of what i love about afrofuturism but in regards to like to this work and this character um i have probably like a hundred projects in my mind that I, I have not gotten to yet and have not had the time to do but i will and um, this is one of the main ones. I um, like little little pieces of her story come to me periodically, and I'll jot them down. Some of them I just leave in my head, but I, I don't forget them. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I can't say too much yet. Only that um, you know, she's a person who um, is uh, her her story takes place in a future that is bleak in some not unlike you know a lot of the ways that maybe our world might be right now at this moment but um you know she has a light that she is um you know refuses to lose and um will use to sh to inspire others um and move forward and to me like i think that's integral to like you know the black experience in america of um you know being faced with unreasonable uh, circumstances and situations beyond our control, but still finding a way to thrive despite that. Um, so yeah, I mean, to me, that that sums up my feelings about Afrofuturism um, as a genre and, and, and why I love it. Thank you, Marcus. I was gonna say to, to yes. link that with something that Fern had mentioned before about Martin Luther King. Uh, I'm reminded of the story where um, Denise Nichols was at a, a, a dinner party function of some kind, and uh, she was thinking about leaving the, you, you remember she was the um, communications officer on the Star Trek uh, uh, series, uh, the Enterprise. And uh, she was talking about leaving the series, going on and do, do some other things. She, she was not completely satisfied there. And uh, someone caught wind of that, and they told this person who uh, was, you know, a fan and the person came over to her and said listen my family and I you know children they they watch you on television we love what you're doing please we heard you're leaving don't leave and uh, that person was Martin Luther King of course you yeah. know the idea of seeing ourselves in the future mm -hmm. right with you know the mothership connection you know Parliament mm -hmm. Funkadelic yeah. Earth Wind and Fire I mean this Sun Ra I mean it goes on in literature uh, this the, that that to go beyond, you know, the strifes and the stress of now, and to transcend that to see ourselves going beyond the present circumstances, you know, recognizing it, you know, but not being limited by it. 
Absolutely. Great. Uh, so let's start now to open up to the audience. The exhibition is engaged. It's meant to start conversations. Um, so if you have a question, um, just go ahead and let us know in the in the chat, and then we'll invite you to um, un unmute yourself. Can I? Can I? Oh, just, sure. Yes, I, please, Fern. Go ahead. I just want to um, congratulate and thank Marcus um, for making his hero a woman. I, I really appreciate that, and I can't wait to see more of what she accomplishes and what her adventures and exploits are like. Mm. Well, I, I, I listen to the women in my life, so I, I can't take credit for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, great, we have um, uh, Royal Brown here. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself so you could talk about futurism. I'll pull up your, um, your images again. Thank you. I just, I just want to like, you know, when we talk about Afrofuturism and even the idea of the spirituality, one of the things that I think is important is that my um, journey, my spiritual journey as somebody who is now a Babalao, um, which is basically like a Nigerian shaman, took me through ancestry down to this very, very deep level. And at that very deep level, I found ancient, ancient Africans like the Dogon and the Egyptian with the very and the Yoruba, which is really within my path itself, with a very, very strong connection to visitors that came from someplace else uh -huh. and knowledge that came from there. So as we talk about Afrofuturism, I don't see the ships and the messages. These are part of a series called Messages and Messages and Messengers. Um, I don't really see them as putting any humans into space at all. I see them as the teachers who came and have been guiding us um, throughout the centuries and uh, as African, as, and again, and I, keep, I kept going down into like going back through the middle passage and seeing the bodies of people that were under the ocean and coming deeper and deeper until I found the this, this, these myths of the Oroko tree and going into the Oroko tree. And there's where the Babalawos would find the visitors that were coming from other dimensions and bringing wisdom and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So instead of looking at it as a projection forward, I look at it as a projection back in the same way that I take these pieces of things that have been discarded by people, junk, things that have been discarded like real wisdom and real knowledge that has been discarded in preference for a Western construct, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of that that's actually, here my cat is here. Um, there's a lot of that that is really a part of where these are um, coming from. And I think that it's important because the future is in the past. Um, we, there's a long, there's, there's a very, very long um, tradition of that in the what we might call African mystical arts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Can I can I respond to that? Yes, please. That really defines my peace transition so beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> the future is in the past. I mean that really that should be the caption to that piece. Yeah. It's like um, even now, there's um, hermetic knowledge, which came from Egypt and Thoth, um, and the, the wisdom of the Odu, um, and the concept that right now, modern physics is building billion dollar particle accelerators and looking at atoms being blown apart and finding things about the nature of the universe that we knew 10,000 years ago. We actually, I mean, the, the, the knowledge is ancient and yet now it's just being discovered, but it's, it's being discovered through this, I don't know, um, almost false materialistic construct that we're living in. So I'll, I'll shut up now because I'll get like too crazy. No, that's, that's great. That's great, Roy. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> we have a question in the chat. Um, it, uh, somebody who doesn't want to uh, speak themselves, um, um, sorry, she said the question was for Michael. I think maybe she meant 
Marcus or maybe Stephen uh, about the, the comments about Parliament, Funkadelic, um, and uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Futurist messages. Um, I really love that link and would like to hear more from him and others about the connection to music. Um, so yeah, question about Afrofuturism and music mm -hmm. and the connection of your work to music uh, for um, um, any, or, any or all of you. I mean, certainly we, we can talk about Janelle Monet. Uh, we can talk about a lot of contemporary uh, artists who are exploring this, this area. Uh, I use the example of, of um, Sun Ra and Earth, Wind and Fire because that comes up from the generation in my formative years. And um, the idea of a, of a ship or alien descending, you know, from another place, you know, and taking us somewhere else, taking us beyond our troubles and cares and so forth, but bringing knowledge, bringing wisdom, you know, to sort of tap into what um, uh, Royal was saying, is that it was bringing us back to ourselves at a deeper level, you know? And so that's one of the things that I, I got from the, from, the, uh, from the musical experience, yeah. Uh, maybe Royal or Fern or someone else, uh, Marcus might wanna add to that as well, Dacia. Um, no, I mean, I, I totally agree. Uh, for me, uh, you know, Parliament was a little bit before my time, but in, in high school, I discovered Parliament Funkadelic and I was like, I was hooked. I started to, you know, basically consume all of it. Um, and it's funny, you know, I was, I was in high school, so I didn't, um, there, there's a way in which I can appreciate um, just the, the, the brilliance of it from an Afrofuturist for a futuristic perspective now and I certainly wasn't you know ascribing that to it at the time but um there was something that it really tapped into something that was both um you know like Royal spoke to um of the past and things that we already knew and I mean in a lot of ways like creative people um activists uh so many of us we're trying to relearn you know I mean like what we've 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 already known or or what was known before us you know what i mean so like so yeah like music period um my my piece of vibrations which is in the exhibit um that's what it deals with um it was a series of uh line drawings of ink drawings that i had done of different black people um enjoying music in their headphones um and the headphones you know to me just represent kind of truly being in your own world with um with whatever you're listening to, um, and each of the people in the in the um, illustrations, they have a name, and there's you know different music that they're listening to. Um, so even though they represent just different Black people of different ages and backgrounds, um, all of the songs are are things that I listen to and I find freedom in in different ways. You know, and like you know when I was a kid, I just would always have my headphones on everywhere I went. Cause I just had always, had, I was always plugged in, you know what I mean, to something. Um, so yeah, I mean like that's, I think it, 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 it's all connected um, definitely, you know, as far as Afrofuturism or just the, the, the creative brilliance that we have as a people um, and the way that, you know, music has translated and it's played such a, a huge role in movements, you know, social movements throughout the years um, you know, going back to the, you know, Harlem Renaissance or just, you know, people like, like Nina Simone who are both artists and activists, you know, at the same time. And uh, so, yeah. Shout out. Yes. <laughs> and I love the way, by the way, you represented the different kinds of music with those different, um, the colors and the shapes and, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely a, a, a big part of, of what I was doing, especially once I applied color to these pieces. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to take what I was hearing in the music and, uh, and translate it visually. Mm -hmm. And it also reminded me of the fact that of the importance, you know, particularly during this whole lockdown period and everything, to go back to the idea of listening to ourselves, listening to our own inner music, you know, our own inner rhythms, you know, and, and in relationship to the natural environment with its cycles and its energy, you know, to feel something there, to feel the oneness of that, you know? Uh, and so when I see the woman, for example, here with her eyes closed, 
you know, the others have their eyes open or at least, at least two of the other people, you know, that tells me about that, that, that deeper state, you know, I, I don't know what you might have been thinking in terms of having some with the eyes closed or some with the eyes open, but does that speak to uh, a deeper level of consciousness in some way? Oh, yeah, definitely. And I mean, I can, I can even speak to what, what they're all listening to. Um, but that, I would say the difference in, you know, expression, um, or just eyes has to do with with how the individuals are vibing to what they're listening to. Um, and then the first one, she's listening to um, Erica Badu, it's specifically a Didn't You Know by Erica Badu. And like that song, just really, um, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. But it's like there, there's a there's a a, a certain atmospheric quality. It's very much about, um, you know, what what was going on with with her individually, um, and you know, like kind of uh, just soul searching. You know what I mean? And and the the music itself, um, I don't know that yellow uh, energy that I I tried to represent there. You know, kind of represents. What I saw in the music, and so yeah. that's the. Um, I wanted her expression to kind of represent the sense of peace that I hear or feel, you know, when I when I hear that song. You know, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just real quick. I think that it like when it comes to the African beat, um, I also think about um, Carlos Santana. Mm -hmm. And I just think, I mean, just to put it really simply, I mean, these are people who took like traditional African drums and literally plugged them into a lamp, an, an, an amp, you know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. you know, just, that's like what it is, you know, um, electrified it. And that to me is ancient and contemporary and also future. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I just want to say very quickly that that also is a component in the show, this intersection, you know, between Latinx and, and the African-American experience or the Black experience, you know, because they are connected, you know, they are, they are one. Uh, certainly my family, you know, is, is a reflection of that, you know, you know, uh, my mother, you know, being Puerto Rican and my father, you know, from the Caribbean, Black. You know, by the way, uh, it's his birthday. He would be 93 today. So uh, shout out uh, to dad. Uh, so I think that uh, this kind of um, this this effort to sort of divide up people, you know, into these different categories and everything, you know, that's the thing that we're we're learning and that we're confronted with, you know, to to face the past. Yes, look at the injustices and so forth. And music and art can be vehicles through which we can address and heal many of these situations. I'm, I'm firmly convinced of that. And that's why I wanted the, the works of all of these artists in this exhibit, you know, represent that promise of the future. The promise of the future, but also the promise of the past to pick up on what Royal was saying. There are many important lessons from the past that we can learn and carry forward with us in our lives. You know, and something that we can we can share that shared humanity, you know, exists in the depths of each of these works if we take the time to listen and observe. We have a question from Aviva Ramani, uh, an artist whose work is also very much about healing. Uh, her eco artwork heals the uh, attempts to heal the planet, uh, and um, she was part of um, uh, one of the creators of Ablutions, a groundbreaking. A feminist work in 1972. Um, Aviva, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your uh, question? Um, this was really, really interesting, and I especially appreciated the relationship between the music and the imagery. But what I always wonder as uh, a new demographic emerges in the art world is how is the aesthetic different? Do any of you feel that there is, in fact, a different aesthetic being expressed in this work that would uh, provide those of us who aren't people of color uh, entry into your ideas that might be different than what we already know? I mean, if I could, I, I think I can speak to that. Um, I think that uh, well, even just the just 
you know, the few of us who are, are represented here today, and then, you know, the, the show, the larger show in general, I think if you look at um, all of our work, uh, you know, there's an incredible diversity to it. But at the same time, there's all these common themes, uh, you know, that have come through just in this discussion and in the work itself. Um, and, you know, when uh, I, I, I got to walk through the show when the work was all being um, laid out and uh, Stephen had kind of, and, and, um, and Aaron had kind of figured out the flow of the show. Um, and I think it really speaks to, and one of the things that's so brilliant about the show, it speaks to the fact that there is no specific aesthetic, you know, um, you know, you got people like, like you got Daisha's work, um, Takis Walters does um, incredible, you know, landscapes with uh, oil pastel and um, it's all, it's all art of the diaspora, you know what I mean? Even though it's um, very, very much diverse. Um, I think our experiences definitely can inform the work and I think infuse it with a lot of um, recurring themes, you know, but I think the way it's translated aesthetically, um, it's, uh, it's boundless, you know, there's no, there's not really any aesthetic, um, specific aesthetic language. I mean, I, th I think where you see those commonalities, it's more a matter of our, our common experiences and the way that it's translated um, through people. So I guess that's my two cents on that. Um, I would I would agree with Marcus on that. These the themes are universal. Um, the individuals happen to have a racial perspective, but I think all of this art comes from the heart, and I think the heart is something that every human being can experience. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um, the work is not something separate. It's not just for African-Americans, even though we might be informed by our ancestors, our history, racism, whatever it is, it still speaks to human emotion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the language we're trying to use and trying to share. Mm. Yes. Thank you. As Terrence, uh said, uh, nothing human is alien to me. But um, actually one other thought that popped into my head too, um, just as, as Fern, as you were articulating, like, you know, what was going on with you in the creation of, you know, some of those photographs, um, a lot of that is very specifically tied to your experience as a black woman, but, you know, not everyone viewing that photograph would interpret it that way. You know what I mean? But like, it's, it's in there, um, you know, and, and I also don't want to take away from the fact that there, there have been very specific, um, you know, visual movements, artistic movements, you know, that are um, specific to, you know, to us culturally. So um, it's, I, you know, it's one of those things where two things can exist at the same time, you know. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It looks like we have two more questions in the chat. Um, the first is from Mark McCarty, uh, who has a question about um, the pandemic. Uh, Mark, do you want to unmute yourself uh, and ask your question? With a pandemic going on, I'm, I'm wondering as working artists whether the sort of the isolation has accelerated or slowed down your work. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Ooh. For me, it's accelerated. Yeah. It's accelerated my work. And um, it's also uh, made me much more introspective as far as I'm going back and now scanning old negatives and working on, you know, my archive. But um, also I'm taking more pictures of nature because it's the only place I can go. <laughs> you know, and I can go without a mask or, um, and I want to point out that the Grand Canyon is a photo that was taken with an iPhone. And uh, it's a nice comparison here with the Yado Studio, which as I said, was film, a medium format camera, um, a lot of uh, well, I put the paraphernalia of the four by five aside, but still um, 
the two different genre, not genres, but um, media, maybe. And uh, so I'm doing more nature photography now than I had than I was before the pandemic. How about everybody else? I'm going to be honest and say, I have got, I think I've got nothing done um, <laughs> <laughs> during this time. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with the combination of the pandemic. And then, like I mentioned before, this just onslaught of anti-Black violence and death in combination with, you know, family tragedies. And I have just personally had a, a terrible um, internal conflict over these past, seems like never ending year. Um, and I keep kicking myself like what well, you're wasting time you're not doing anything. Um, but also I feel like I just don't have any headspace to to see through right now. It's a it's emerging a little bit right now, but I yeah I've complained to all of my friends and family how I can't do anything and I haven't done anything making art that being said. I'm doing some other socially active things, but the artwork I've found really, really hard and I've been struggling a lot with even being able to think about it. Yeah, it's weird times. Yeah. Um, like for me, I don't think it made it too much of a difference as far as art making, because I'm kind of an addict when it comes to that. I just keep building these things. They just keep coming and coming and coming. They're like mushrooms in my studio they just keep popping up um, but i but i will say that um some of the things that have been going on uh there is two things there is a sense of hope because what we are going through is a transformation and i believe in a deep level that all the destruction is necessary for some creation but mm -hmm. then again with some of the stuff like the um the you know, anti-Black violence and things like that and some of the other things going on. I will say that a lot of the ships that I've been building have been getting more and more weapons built into them mm. as time has gone on. <laughs> yeah, um, well, there's definitely, you know, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of uh, common themes tonight and uh, my experience this past year has been, been very strange. I mean, like everyone's, but Strange in the sense that um, I, I envision this way going a certain this year going a certain way. You know, the the Black Panther book is due um, is is coming out in January 2021. So I, I think I had one idea of what my working uh, just just everything around you know me completing the book um, you know a month ago was going to look like. Mm -hmm. And um, so you know as I was in the deep into the second half of trying to trying complete, to complete this, book, this book um you know global pandemic uh happened you know and and everything was crazy and it uh it, it threw everything into question just about like you know productivity etc um but much as uh you know daisha spoke to um and royal spoke to the um the things that are going on in our current events specifically um, with, you know, just injustice, um, as well as, you know, Black people rising up and, and others, you know, rising up, um, asking, uh, you know, demanding justice, you know, it, it tied in perfectly with the work and the story that I was telling, you know what I mean? So it actually fueled me. Um, once I kind of shook off that initial, like, you know, how am I supposed to get, get this done? Like, you know, is everything going to go as planned? You know, I just, I was fueled by everything going on socially in our country. Um, and the, 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 the timeliness um, was really, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was just all about the timeliness, you know? And it, it's sad because I have other pieces of art, um, you know, similar to how like Daisha created art around um, the time of like Trayvon Martin's killing and um, so many others. Like I have pieces that I did back then that specifically dealt with police violence. And um, 
I always say that I'm waiting for the day when they're less relevant, you know, mm -hmm. um, but um, hopefully this is a period of transition and we will see a day or our, our children will see a day when, um, you know, some of that work is less timely. Mm -hmm. Um, our last question comes uh, from a brilliant student, uh, Raven Holmes. Uh, Raven, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? So my question is, with more modern art, what does anyone think is the best medium to do it in? Because I understand that for many people that I am more familiar with use the art medium of gaming as it means of telling a story and be able to inform people about certain events and certain culture. So what is everyone's view on that? Well, I would say you have to be the, the one to decide that. What, what medium resonates in you? You have to be the voice. So you decide that question. Yeah, I, I would agree because I um, even personally, uh, you know, have spent a lot of time playing with different mediums. Um, you know, like the, the work on the book is digital. I love to paint. Uh, I love to draw, you know, traditionally and um, digitally. So I think that having uh, multiple mediums, you know, at your disposal is always helpful because it, it gives you options and i mean for me the way i decide what medium i need to work in at a given moment it's dictated by what i want to say or what i need to say at that moment so um yeah i would say like it's not i don't think there there are any limitations and i mean like it's cool that you bring up the medium of, of gaming i mean you know that's another definitely like there's a like movie level, you know, storytelling going on in gaming right now. So um, yeah, there's endless ways to tell stories. I would also just like to um, encourage particularly the students to not feel the need to um, categorize yourself or, or just choose one medium. Yeah. I, I found myself asking myself like just a few years ago, wait, who said that you only could do photography? Because I was a studio art major at uh, St. Rose and, and I love painting and printmaking and, and Talio and, and all of those things. But somehow along, you know, along the past decade and a half, I thought I could only do photography and my hands just want to do more things now. And I, and I thought to myself, I don't know how I got, how I got here. Cause I don't remember anyone saying it specifically, but I think it's important for the students to realize at this point that they should always keep their options open and, and just move towards the medium that, you know, lends itself to the work that you want to make and, and you never, just never put anything to the side. It's always available to you, no matter how much experience you've had with it, I'd say. I, I have another point on that subject. Um, back in the day when I was a corporate uh, graphic designer, I wanted to take pictures of some of the people that were being invited into the corporation. And um, my boss said to me, you're a graphic designer, not a photographer. Mm. And it was shortly after that, I quit the corporate world yeah. <laughs> and began work on the artist portrait series. Mm. So don't I, listen to those people, follow your heart. I, I won't take up any more time, but I have very similar experiences and I also I agree 100 percent. Thank you. Thank you all for those comments. And I think the um, advice to students is a wonderful way to close as we're hoping that in the next step in, in engage will be for it, for students to be able to um, uh, to respond um, to this work and keep the conversations going um, in our 
um, community. And thank you, everyone. Uh, I know many of you are tuning in from um, uh, near and far. Uh, for those of you who are near the Capital District, Engage Artists in Visual Dialogue is up through November 21st. Um, and the uh, gallery is open Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, noon to five. And then Wednesday and Thursday, we're open a little later um, until um, eight o'clock. Um, thank you again, Stephen J. Tyson, uh, Daisha Devon Harris, Marcus K. Anderson, and Fern Logan for sharing your stories, um, sharing your artwork, your vision with us, um, and helping our community, our world to um, to work through this, giving us a, a, a point of departure. Um, you know, a, a, your work is really a guide um, for all of us um, as we're trying to navigate into an, an anti-racist future. And I, I thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Robert, uh, for moderating this event. Thank you to the artists on the panel, the, all the participant, participating artists. Uh, we didn't have a chance to, to obviously address all of their works, but I also want to thank the audience, the people who, who tuned in uh, to check this out. Bring that message to your communities. Be inspired uh, within your own life, you know, to help to make this the more beloved country, beloved community that we all desire. Thank you. So uh, in the tradition of the uh, Brooklyn Rail, we're going to close um, our uh, meeting with a poem. Um, this poem by Langston Hughes, um, you'll find is uh, as timely as ever. Um, and it's also quoted um, by Daisha Devon Harris in her piece on view at the, uh, in the exhibition, uh, particularly these two lines, I do not need my freedom when I'm dead, I cannot live on tomorrow's bread. Um, so freedom by Langston Hughes. Freedom will not come today, this year, nor ever through compromise and fear. I have as much right as the other fellow has to stand on my two feet and own the land. I tire so of hearing people say, let things take their course. Tomorrow is another day. I do not need my freedom when I'm dead. I cannot live on tomorrow's bread. Freedom is a strong seed planted in a great need. I live here too. I want my freedom just as you. Thank you again to all our panelists, uh, to all our exhibiting artists, and to all of you uh, for um, uh, tuning in tonight. Uh, be well and be safe. Thank you.